Okay, and next up, uh, we are switching from jets to vehicles. Um, so we have uh, Laura McGregor here from StepSolve Analytical, um, who will be speaking to us about vehicle emissions. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present and for putting together such a fantastic program over the next few days. Um, I know it takes a lot of time and effort, but we definitely appreciate it. I know I'd appreciate it even more if it was in Hawaii next year, but we'll see. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about applying GCGC as a technique to vehicle emissions. And some of this work has been done in such so demonstration labs, but we've also collaborated with the team at Emissions Analytics. And they are a leading testing and data specialist that are based in the UK. And their goal is really to measure real world emissions and try to help guide the automotive industry towards better practices. So what I'm going to show here is trying to get a better picture of all the ways that you can be polluting the environment from vehicles or um, indeed just releasing compounds that could be adverse to our health. So first of all, very, very quickly, um, for those of you who haven't heard of Sapsov Analytical before, um, we're part of the Schoenberg Analytics company with Marks International. So between the two, um, groups here, Marks and Sapsol, we're manufacturing instruments for measuring volatile organic compounds and semi-volatiles. So Marks are focusing on thermal desorption and the sampling aspects, whereas at Sapsol we're focusing on the separation, the detection and the data analysis. So today I'll be showing you the combination of the two uh, techniques to be able to look at the vehicle emissions. Um, like I said, we're wanting to get a better idea of all the ways that vehicles are contributing emissions. So traditionally, we always think of the tailpipe or exhaust emissions, but actually you've got issues from the materials that are inside the car as well. And whoever is driving and passengers in the car will be exposed to any emissions from those. And uh, more recently, the focus has shifted to tyre and brake wear emissions because, of course, we've got all these new hybrid and electric vehicles coming out where the exhaust emissions aren't so important, but they're heavier vehicles, so the tyre wear emissions are actually even more of an issue. So I want to start. components. Um, traditionally, the VOCs and the fog condensables, but also the odour aspects because the number one most complained about thing with cars, um, especially in um, countries like China, has been the um, new car smell. So it hasn't been anything to do with the actual driving and the use of the car, it's been the new car smell. So the odour aspect is important. The ones that are greyed out, I'm not going to focus on so much in this uh, presentation, but these are the ones that are coming from outside and making their way into the, the car. So they're also contributing to the, the interior air quality. Now, the difficulty when it comes to material emissions is that there's so many different components within the car itself. The textiles, the, the dashboards, the foam for the cushions. So there's a wide range of testing that's required. And in terms of research and development, the automotive industry, like many other industries, is being pressurised to use more sustainable products. So in that way, we need to be able to have um, very robust quality control to test how these could be then impacting the uh, interior air quality. And at the moment, the regulatory uh, landscape for this type of work is incredibly complex. You've got all of these different um, methods that can be summed up as belonging to five different types of sampling approach. But they can be not only region specific, but also manufacturer specific. So you can have some methods that are only applicable to BMW, not any of the other 
automotive manufacturers. So it makes it quite complicated. Some harmonization has been done to bring these methods into ISO standards. But importantly, all of them can be performed using thermal desorption and then GCFID or GCMS. So from any of the different sampling approaches, the VOCs and SVOCs can be trapped onto a sorbent chip. Um, so that can contain a single sorbent or multi-bed sorbent before analysis by uh, GCFID or GCMS, like we can see there. So that allows you to get an idea of what's in the, the interior air. We can see from this example two different car models where we sampled two litres of the interior air onto our servant tube and then analysed by GC TOFMS. And if you're looking for target compounds that are in the regulated methods, that's fair enough. You can zoom in on the specific EICs, find those peaks. But if you're looking to do more research and development and screen these samples and find odorous compounds or other hazardous compounds that you're not necessarily searching for or that aren't necessarily regulated, we can see in this small portion that's just highlighted from the top chromatogram that you've got xylenes and then uh, an aroma active compound there that are hidden beneath that cyclohexanone peak. So you wouldn't have spotted that and it would have slipped through the net. So that's of course why we're applying GCGC and time of flight for this type of analysis. I'm not going to go into detail about exactly what was used here, but if you want to pull me aside at one of the, the lunch breaks, I can talk more about that. But for the first part of the study, we're looking at direct desorption of different materials. So simply placing a small amount of the material within an empty TD tube desorbing that onto the, the GCGC and TOF MS. In this case, using our reverse fill flush flow modulator, the on-site device that you can see there, before uh, detection with the bench 12 2 time of flight system, and then comparisons with the Chrome Compare Plus software, using a similar approach to the tail-based analysis that we just heard about. And when we applied that to some different materials, I think the benefit is pretty clear there for a composite foam sample where you're getting a lot more information on the different compounds that could be making their way into the, the interior area of the vehicle. And importantly, you're able to see things that you weren't looking for in the first place. With that chromatogram, I didn't think that we were going to be looking for PFAS compounds, but of course we are able to find this uh, trace acrylate. I think that's fluorotelomer acrylate. Always difficult to pronounce these names. But they are these forever chemicals. They're, um, they have really bad adverse health effects. So it's important to be able to know what's in there. So it's um, future proofing this type of analysis. Um, and of course, can be applied to many, many different types of materials, like the ones that you can see in this example here. And just to take a quick look at the rubber one, in this example, this is where the odour aspect came in. Um, because if we zoom in at the front end, where there's a lot of the very volatile um, components, we can see we've got this um, peak at the beginning here, which was identified as butyl mercaptan, and that has a really undesirable garlic odour, which you don't want to be present in the cabin of your vehicle. So having that flow modulation to be able to look at the volatiles and identify these compounds is really important. So that covers some of the material emissions in the interior air. Moving on to the exhaust emissions aspect, this is where I've incorporated some of the, the collaborative work we've got with Emissions Analytics, where they're looking more at the, the real world aspect for these exhaust emissions. So trying to monitor them in situ. So they've developed this patent pending design and this contraption that goes onto the back of the cars, where there can be multiple uh, TD sorbent tubes 
so that while they're driving, there's a valve based system that when they move from rural driving to urban or to motorway driving, they can switch to collect the different VOCs onto different tubes and monitor changes in the exhaust emissions between the different driving modes. And uh, so far they've been looking at eight different VOCs. Uh, hopefully this is going to expand out very soon, but a mix of different hybridization levels as well. Um, and I've included just an example here to show you one of the, the chromatograms that they've um, got for these exhaust emissions, because I think it's a really nice example of using the full separation space there. Um, but what we can see when we actually look at the tabulated results is that there isn't a defined trend yet between the um, engine type, because we can see that the Renault Clio at the top, the gasoline engine, has the lowest emissions overall, but the ones for the urban, rural and motorway with the highest emissions are all also gasoline engines. So the plan is to expand out this testing a lot more to see if we can actually see trends with these. This is just for the pHs and the nitrogen containing compounds um, being the, the, uh, the ones of greatest concern, of course. But the same thing can be true with um, some of the other classes that have been looked at and um, quantified based on the, the toluene equivalence here. So again, we're not seeing a defined trend with the, um, the engine types. But hopefully by incorporating more of these hybrid vehicles, the ones that are full hybrid or plug-in hybrid ones, we'll be able to see more trends rather than it being manufacturer specific as it is at the moment. Then finally, we have the tyre and footwear aspect. So I mentioned that this is becoming increasingly important because there are so many of these hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles, which of course have no exhaust emissions whatsoever, but they're heavier. So it's putting more pressure on the tires and generating more tire wear and releasing more emissions from that aspect. And what we've seen is that Actually, there's over 300,000 tonnes of tyre rubber that's released into the environment within the US and Europe annually. So that's been calculated based on the, the number of cars that are in use. But there's little understanding as to what these um, the tyres are actually emitting, like what compounds are making their way into the environment, what the fate of them is and what uh, the potential hazards of these compounds are, the toxicology behind them. So what the team at Emissions Analytics are doing is creating a fingerprinting database to try to help show the differences in tyre composition across different manufacturers because the automotive industry is notoriously secretive when it comes to these things. So they're trying to create this database that is uh, anonymised just to try and help guide them towards better practices and greener compositions. Because changing the tyre model is actually the easiest way to try and control these emissions. When you look at some of the other options on there, like reducing speed, only driving in certain weather conditions, reducing the vehicle weight, those are things that you're not going to be able to enforce very easily. And when we look at some of the chromatograms that um, we've been able to get with uh, thermal desorption and GCGC TOF, you can see the huge amount of um, peaks that we've got in different classes that are in these tire emissions. So many of these compounds aren't regulated at all. A few of them are within the reach uh, regulations, but not many. It's mostly the power TPHs but there's a huge range of other components present there. So that's why it has been key to create these chemical fingerprinting databases. And so far, they've measured over 250 different towers and they've been comparing them in the Chrome Compare Plus software to try and spot differences that are unique to certain manufacturers. 
And in the table here, we've got uh, just 10 of the towers shown. Uh, the top um, pH producers and aromatic producers, and then the lowest emitting uh, for pHs and aromatics. And you can see from that final column there that there's a tenfold difference between the lowest emitting and the highest. So it's incredibly variable, um, the composition of these towers, and that's where the fingerprinting database is really coming into play. And I mentioned that isn't just the pHs and the common aromatics. Just zooming in on a very small portion of the chromatogram here, you can see the different types of compounds that are present from oxygenates, acids, to uh, various different nitrogen containing compounds. And I've highlighted one in red in particular here, because that's a preservative called 6PPD, and it is shown to be um, quite hazardous to aquatic organisms, so specifically salmon and trout, when the tire where uh, entire dust has been running off into urban rivers, it's been killing off the salmon and trout. So it's one that um, is under a lot of scrutiny at the moment. But what we can see from the actual um, analysis of 250 different towers, 97% of them contain that compound. So it's going to be, it's ubiquitous to a lot of these different manufacturers, even though there are alternatives present, like the IPP on the, the right there, and only 13% of the tires tested actually had that compound. So this is where emissions analytics are trying to guide the automotive industry to show them that there are alternatives present that are potentially less hazardous and um, still performing the same function. It's still a preservative, but aren't going to cause the same problems as what 6PPD does. Uh, and I should mention as well that there's currently a public consultation going on at the moment. The UNECE, or the United Nations um, Economic Commission for Europe, together with the EU, uh, are working together to try and regulate tyre wear. So the next logical step is then to regulate the compounds that are being emitted from tyre wear. So this presentation is just giving an overview of um, how GCGC can be applied to a different type of um, application, so the vehicle emissions, where it has the flexibility to look at all of those different sources of VOCs from the materials to look at the uh, VOCs in the air, as well as the, the tires and the exhaust emissions. So it's future proofing to be able to um, help do more research and development into new compositions of tires or new compositions of materials to make sure that the vehicles aren't going to be having as much of an environmental impact that they currently do. So I would like to thank uh, Emmy and Nick from Emissions Analytics, who did a lot of the, the work on the real world testing that was shown there. And then my colleague Caroline from Marks International, who helped me to navigate my way through the, the regulatory aspects of the, the automotive industry. And thank you very much for listening. If we have any time for questions, you can answer those now or you can contact me using the email there. Thank you.